Um, this is the fun talk tonight. <laughs> so the plan for the evening is I'm going to give a quick chat a little bit about some cocktails, some astronomy facts, and then uh, I'm going to keep the Zoom meeting open and then everyone can just hang out and chat until um, about nine o'clock is when technically we're supposed to shut things down. So in case I know I've been in the club for two and a half years now, but for half that time, we haven't been able to get together. So if I haven't met you in person, I hope I'll be able to soon. Um, my name is Angel. I am on the board and um, you can often find me out at Stubb Stewart with my 10 inch Newtonian. I usually have a couple of astro lists I'm working on and I seem to have a lot of lists that don't get finished that I should be finishing. So hopefully I'll see you out there observing this summer. All right, so if everyone's ready, we're gonna get started. The original plan was Mark said, hey, we need some people to talk at the Astro Fair. And I jokingly said, oh, everyone's gonna be at home sitting in their PJs. We should talk about cocktails. And I was <laughs> joking. And Mark said, that sounds great, let's do it. So you've all been warned, if you want more serious talks next year, it's your responsibility. So the plan tonight is I've got five different cocktails we're gonna talk about and some fun space facts to go with each one of those cocktails. Um, feel free to cocktail along if you want. All right, so first up are solar flares. Now, the big question of course is what's a solar flare? And the most simple explanation is simply that they are massive explosions. They're actually the largest explosions in our solar system. And when they do explode, they release huge amounts of radiation out into space. Now these solar flares can last for just a few minutes or they can last for hours at a time. Of course, solar flares don't party alone. They, uh, they like to get together. So we'll often see solar flares with other activity on the surface of the sun, including sunspots and coronal mass ejections. Now these three activities that happen on the surface of the sun are separate, but again, they often go together. And that's because sunspots are the places on the surface of the sun where the magnetic field has become twisted and tangled and what happens is it holds in the heat, making the sunspot dark. And when the magnetic fields snap back into place, that's when we get solar flares and coronal mass ejections. But to focus on the solar flares, scientists often, well, not often, scientists do classify solar flares very similar to the way we do earthquakes here on earth. So they are given a class system and each one of those classes represents a tenfold increase in size. Um, mm -hmm. So the classes are, and make sure I get it right, they are classified as A, which is the smallest, and then they run through B, C, M, and X. Now, it, additionally, each one of those classes is also broken down in one through nine. Obviously, they hadn't seen Spinal Tap or they would have done one through 11. <laughs> but X, so I hope someone gets that joke. Um, <laughs> The X flare though, which is the largest a solar flare can be, it actually has no limit. So you can have an X that's above, um, an X9 or above. Now, I'm, I'm sure many of us have heard about NASA's uh, Parker Solar Probe, which is circling the sun right now. It actually back in April, so just recently, a few weeks ago, made its eighth flyby of the sun. And at the time it did its circle, it was only 6 million miles um, from the sun's surface. It was also going 300 miles, 300,000 miles per hour. So the Parker Solar Probe is going to be circling the sun until 2025. The goal is to have 24 flybys. And each one of those flybys of the sun will actually be a little bit closer each time. With the goal of the final one, it will only be 3 million miles from the surface of the sun. Now to accomplish these flybys and to get that little bit closer each time and to build up the speed, um, the probe is also doing um, using Venus as an assist. So it's gonna circle around Venus eight different times. 
So actually we're getting not just some great information and science facts about the sun, but the probe has actually provided some interesting tidbits about the atmosphere of Venus recently as well. So now of course, we're gonna talk cocktails as well. So I know that I could go on and on about the uh, solar flares and the surface sun, but we're here to have a little bit of fun too. So, all right, so this is our solar flare cocktail. Um, so this cocktail is really easy. Actually, you take almost everything um, that's needed, which is the juice of one lime. This is a very juice heavy drink. Actually, it's very healthy for you probably. Don't worry, this is water, not a cocktail. Um, <laughs> so you wanna take the juice of one lime. You wanna um, take about a shot and a half of um, orange juice. And then you're also gonna be using pineapple juice and you're gonna mix those all in a shaker. So hopefully everyone's got a shaker so we can get this ready. Now I use, it's three ounces of pineapple juice. I happen to have those little great um, six ounce pineapple juice around so they'll make two drinks. So just half of that. Then you'll wanna add two types of rum, which um, a white rum, not a dark, you get a weird color and then a coconut rum for a little bit of extra flavor. So two shots of rum in there. Give everything a really good shake. Um, do shake horizontally, point it away from other people. I have learned this the hard way because <laughs> things happen. So pour that out um, in a tumbler glass over a little bit of ice. And then you've got this beautiful summery sun color, but to get the solar flare bit of it, you wanna take a little tiny bit of grenadine and just dump that right in there. And you get yourself a little tiny, and eh, maybe B-class solar flare. So there you go. All right, first drink down. Woohoo! <laughs> so <laughs> moving on, I wanna cool things down from the sun and we are gonna talk about the moon. Now, many people, of course, many astronomers are constantly complaining because the moon is so bright and they really wanna go out observing. And it's only bright, of course, on a clear night. Now I used to think exactly the same way. However, I've really come around to moon observing. There are hundreds, really thousands of things to see on the moon. So I wanna encourage you to get out even when it's a bright, clear night and actually observe a few things. And to do that, I'm gonna give you kind of a rundown of some of the, the more basic features you'll find when you're out doing some of your observing. So one of the first things, of course, we'll notice on the moon is that it's made up of seas and craters. And these, of course, you can see without a telescope. We can see them with our naked eye. Now the seas are not, as once believed, made of water, sadly. They are, in fact, historically, were lava flows from the um, early stage of moon development. Now, when it comes to craters on the moon, there are an infinite variety of sizes and craters to choose from. Because the moon has no atmosphere, it means that absolutely any piece speck of dust can make its way to the moon's surface. And so you get craters of absolutely every size. Now, connected with craters, of course, are the rays that will shoot out from some of the larger craters out there. Now, rays are a little bit different when you're observing them. Um, you'll actually, instead of looking on the terminator, the line between dark, the lit and unlit side, which is where you normally want to observe moon, the moon, um, to really see the rays the best, you need to wait until the moon is full bright lit, and then those rays are going to be really obvious against the moon's surface. Three other things that you'll notice, features you'll find on the moon quite often, are the cracks, cliffs, and valleys. So rills, which are the cracks, if we want to use our fancy Latin bit, is they are actually formed in different ways. However, scientists just refer to them all as rills, uh, more based on how they look than how they were formed. So the Hadley rill, which is near the center of the moon, it was actually a lava tube. But however, we're a few billion years too late to see the lava flowing through it. Um, one of the most common types of rills you'll come across on the moon are the rills that are represented there in the Hippolos rills. And they're formed when lava cools 
and that it actually creates this series of cracks um, that are around. So you'll see those quite a bit, but the hippos rills are probably some of the best examples to be able to find. So the most famous crack or cliff on the moon is actually the straight wall. Now, when you are out observing the, and you come across the straight wall and the shadows are perfect on it, it looks incredibly dramatic. However, interestingly, it's only about a thousand feet tall. So it's shorter than our coast range in some places. And it's all about catching the shadows just right on it. Now, the moon also, of course, has valleys. Um, these can form in a multitude of ways. So they can be lava tubes that collapsed. They can be lava at one point that flowed and carved out, or even geological faults. So these particular type of features on the moon, the valleys, um, they're actually often quite narrow, and but long. So they can be a little bit of a challenge when you're out observing. Finally, like here on Earth, the moon has mountains. And of course, many of the mountains on the moon are named for mountain ranges on the Earth, just to keep it confusing. Um, the moon has, just like here, full ranges. We also have individual little mountain peaks to look for. Um, these, however, mountains on the moon are not formed by tectonic plates like they were here on Earth. Um, they're really typically formed, or what they believe, um, the result of large impacts on the moon. And then the magma was released underneath the surface actually creating those mountains. So I wanted to give you a couple of good things to go looking for this week um, as the moon is nears full uh, here in just another week. Um, hopefully we'll have some clear skies. So if you do get out in some clear skies, of course the first thing many of us go looking for on the moon is craters. And when you are looking for at craters, there's a couple of key features to look for no matter the crater. Um, you'll want to first check out, does the crater have a mountain in the middle? Because many of them will. Um, and you'll be able to pick out that peak based on the shadow. Of course, craters often, often come with little craterlets. So you'll find little smaller craters um, embedded all around the crater and sometimes on the inside. And one of the most interesting features to look for in a crater is the walls of the crater. So depending on the age of the crater, the walls could be very intact and still very straight, or they could have collapsed over time, telling us that that crater is quite a bit older. If you wanna go looking for a mountain, Mount Pico is one of the best to go find for your first try. It actually will stand out very, very brightly um, against the dark plain uh, behind it. And then finally, um, late in the week, maybe towards the weekend, um, Schroeder's Valley is absolutely one of my favorite things to observe on the moon. It is always gorgeous. And so I definitely recommend going to try and find that one. Of course, Jim already mentioned this, but we have a lunar eclipse coming up. It is at four in the morning on the 26th. Do not have a bunch of cocktails on the 25th because you won't want to get up at four in the morning on the 26th. Um, again, we won't be able to catch the entire eclipse, but we will be able to catch the most important part of it and be able to see the moon fully covered by the Earth's shadow. So I definitely recommend setting your alarm for the 26th. All right, let's talk another cocktail, not this science bit. So this moonlight cocktail actually, interestingly enough, has been around for many years. So it's actually an older cocktail recipe that um, I enjoy. It's really easy. Again, you'll want to take your shaker. You're going to add your lime juice, um, gin. I personally recommend the local gin, Free Spirit. Um, it's good. It doesn't taste like you're gnawing on a tree like some gin. Uh, then you want to add the cream de violette and the contro. Give those, again, another good shake. Go girl, shake it. All right, so shaking just mixes the flavors, of course, and cools the drink down. So you don't need to be down or shaken for like 30 seconds a minute, just a good five, 10 seconds, depending on your strength, will get the work done. I tend to serve this one in a martini glass because if we want to feel fancy. However, if you're sitting at home alone in your PJs, like some of us are now, you can serve it however you want. Also, a little lime peel right there on the top really makes it nice. All right, 
So moving on, let's talk about Mars. Um, obviously, Mars is a place that does not have any higher forms of life, but it is a very busy planet full of robots. So we have, NASA has, three different robots there right now. Sorry, I shouldn't say robots, rovers. And China just landed its fourth. So there's a lot going on there on the surface. We have Curiosity, which has been there since 2012. We also have um, Insight, which landed back in 2018, focused on the interior of the planet. Um, Insight actually just last month recorded two different um, good sized Mars quakes. However, I would say over the next few months, um, Insight is actually going to go into kind of a semi-hibernation -hiber simply because um, it's gonna be winter where it is. So it's just saving energy, but that's okay because that gives time for perseverance to shine. Um, that's what we've all been hearing about and it's great little helicopter ingenuity. Now, of course, humans have been sending probes to Mars since the 1960s. We've been landing rovers on Mars since the 1970s. And during that time, we have absolutely transformed our view of the Martian planet, of the planet. We have gone from thinking that, you know, it's canals full of water to this dry emptiness of nothing to wait, there was water and there was a lot of it. Now we want to know, was there life? And that's really the role of perseverance. So Mars is calling Perseverance their first astrobiology focused rover. So the goal of Perseverance, they know now that Mars had water in the past. It had quite a bit of water and it also had that water for an extended period of time, which means Perseverance's goal is to really dig down and find out, did anything life develop in that water? Did something live there at one point? Part of the other aspect of perseverance, of course, is to try out new technology. And that's what we've all been hearing about is the Ingenuity helicopter, which is part of this new technology. And I have to say, I have not got tired of this little video yet. Watching what is quite, well, I'm sure, is the most expensive drone in the solar system fly around on another planet is absolutely outstanding. Uh, in terms of, well, we've got this new technology, we don't really know how it's gonna work. NASA has hit it out of the park. Um, they have a ma managed to fly a few feet, they've managed to fly further, and now um, Ingenuity has managed to fly and land in its own area and not even return all the way to Perseverance. So NASA has done an absolutely amazing job with this little ingenuity. I know my son keeps talking about if he's gonna get a drone like ingenuity and it's, it's not gonna happen. Something much simpler. All right, let's do another cocktail. So this one I like to think about as an absolute celebration of all the work that NASA has put in to exploring Mars. Sorry, I'm really thirsty. All right, here we go. So this drink is a little bit different. It actually doesn't require a shaker, but we are going to get to first. You wanna rim your uh, glass with a little bit of red sugar. I like to think of them as like the red rocks of Mars. So rim, using a lemon to wet the top of the glass, you can put a little red sugar on the top. Next, we're gonna layer things in. So you add your vodka, that's like a honor of the USSR who tried first to launch um, their probes to Mars before the US tried. Next, we need our red color, which is the Chambord. Then finally, to celebrate, we add a little bit of sparkling wine, because celebration. Finally, you wanna use the fancy technique, because this will totally impress your friends when you make them later. You wanna float ever so gently the rest of the Chambord um, over the top. And then, because we're exploring Mars, a tiny little ice cube to represent, you know, the ice on Mars, and a little twist of lemon for the twisting ingenuity. All right. Whew, three cocktails. So at this point, um, we're probably seeing double because we're three cocktails in. So I thought, let's talk double stars. This will be fun. All right. 
Um, I didn't know, fun space fact, Mitzar was actually the first double star that was looked at through a telescope. And that was all the way back in 1617. And since then, scientists have been absolutely racking up the number of double stars in our solar, in our galaxy. And that's because they turned out to be fairly common. Um, double stars actually come in two varieties, and that is stars that simply look like double stars from our perspective here on Earth, or ones that are truly binary systems where the two stars are rotating around each other. And in fact, we will call both of these things double stars because scientists in many um, many times don't actually know which ones um, the double st the stars we're looking at belong to. Should they be? Are they binary systems, or they just happen to be in a perfect alignment for our eyes? So it's thought here in the northern hemisphere that when you go out looking under the sky, about one in eighteen stars is a double star. So my theory is most of the time you're out observing, you're probably going to run into a double star, which means I wanted to talk about what to look for when you're out finding double stars. The first thing, of course, is color, because we're astronomers. We're visually excited about looking at the stars. So finding ones with unique colors is always fun. Color also will tell you um, some information about the age of the star, tell you a little bit about even the temperature of the star. Of course, color can be relative. So sometimes it's fun to compare with your neighbor as to what colors they might actually be seeing when they're looking at double stars. Another aspect of looking at double stars is size, because just like any other type of single star, double stars come in a variety of sizes and magnitudes. And in fact, there's a number of double stars out there where the real challenge is to see the much smaller, dimmer star compared to the primary star in the pair. Finally, separation and position. And separation is exactly what it sounds like. How far apart are these double stars? But position angle is actually a little bit more complicated concept. And it's simply asking us, what are the stars relative to each other? How do they lie in the sky? So the, to figure out the position angle, it's really easy. Just determine which um, star is the primary star, and that's usually the brighter star of the pair. And then as long as you know your compass points, whether you're looking in a telescope or just binoculars, you can determine exactly which degree, knowing that east is 90, west is 270, south is 180, exactly where the two stars are in relation to each other tells you the position angle. All right, so I wanted to give you some examples of great double stars to go looking for this summer when you're out observing. The first one to look for is Alpha Hercules. And this star is about 360 light years away from us. It technically is a triple system, but we can only see two of the stars in the system. It's a great double star to go find because it is, um, they're both, they're close together. So you definitely know you found them and you know that they're a pair. The other thing is that they are different magnitudes and different colors. And interestingly, the larger star in the pair is a pulsating variable star. So that's always fun. Another great double star is 70 Ophiuchus. So this star is much closer. It's only 16 light years away from us. And we know for a fact that this star in particular is um, a binary system. So it was actually discovered to be binary by William Herschel. So we've known it for quite some time. Um, and it's so close to us and it's such an obvious binary that if you follow this star and track it for a couple of years, you will actually see the stars rotate and move around each other. The entire cycle only takes 80 years, which in you know astronomical time is just a blink of an eye. Finally, Gamma Daphini, or the nose of the dolphin, is a double star. Um, it's a great one to look at because it has two different colors and they're very unique. So one star is orange and the other star presents is green, which is a little unique in the sky. Um, the other thing, this is a great one. You can see it, like if you're out at Stubb Stewart or anywhere else that's a little darker, you can actually see the star with your naked eye, but you'd need a telescope, of course, to um, be able to split it. All right, Whew. 
no more science, let's talk whiskey. <laughs> so we're gonna do the double star. This um, one is gonna teach you some new bar tricks to, uh, again, impress your friends and family when we can finally get together this summer. So this drink, you're gonna need a shaker, again, filled it with ice, um, two shots of whiskey, because it's, well, I'm not gonna lie. I tried this one yesterday when I made the video and it's, it's pretty good. So simple syrup, a little bit of lemon juice. And for those who don't know, simple syrup is just um, sugar and water in equal measure. You heat them up on the stove till the sugar dissolves. And then that way you'll have, um, you can um, use that as your simple syrup. So give it a good shake. And then you wanna pour that out over a tumbler. Um, you can use just ice cubes. I happen to have uh, one giant ice cube. So we pour it out over that and we get this beautiful golden star color. But to make it a true double star, we need to add another color. So to do that, you wanna take your bar spoon and hold it very close to the glass and pour just a shot of Shiraz, which sounds, I know, weird, but it's actually really good. Um, Shiraz right over the top, and you get a double star, two-colored drink. Um, I did not get a chance to figure out a double star that's both gold and red. So if anyone can tell me, I'd love to hear. All right, we have made it to the last cocktail of the night, which appropriately should probably be called the end of the universe because five cocktails is a lot. So finally, we're gonna, I'm gonna recommend this book. So this is a book by Dr. Katie Mack, who is a cosmologist. It actually, the book actually came out last summer um, and it, it was a bestseller at the time. It got a lot of great reviews. So you might've heard of it, but if you haven't had a chance to pick it up, I will highly recommend it, um, an excellent read. So Dr. Katie Mack, as I said, is a cosmologist thinking about the big picture of the universe. And what she's doing here in this book is using, taking five different ways that the universe might actually end and really looking at the science of how that would happen, how likely that, you know, that particular ending would be the one that we, you know, is the one that finally does us in. Um, and it's really fascinating. She does an excellent job of the writing. It's often quite witty, surprisingly, for a science book. And it wasn't depressing at all. Many people were worried it would be, but it was an excellent read, so I'll highly recommend it. And then I'm going to, let's try this. So here is our end of the universe cocktail. And I'm going to see if I can stop sharing my screen because my goal is to make this live. So let's see if we can do it. All right. And for anybody who can hear that behind me is my dog, of course, who's decided that this is the exact time that she's gonna dig a hole in the couch because I can't yell at her. So that's awesome. All right, so let me, I'm gonna scroll it down. I thought you needed to have one drink done live. So hopefully everyone can see that. Gonna take our shaker, but no ice. And you are going to add blackberries, fresh blackberries. So this is another good one for the summer. Um, I like to use berries and herbs actually in cocktails over the summer. We are going to add lemon juice, Cointreau, again, no ice. And then we're going to do the fancy thing called muddling, which just means you can buy an actual fancy muddler. I just use a spoon. You just want to gently squish the, cocked, the uh, blackberries. This is not a dramatic end of the universe here. This is just a gentle fading off into the night, really. So we're just going to squish the blackberries and release some of the juice and also make the drink a little dark because I do think an end of the universe drink needs to be kind of dark. So once you've done that, once we've muddled our blackberries in there, that is when we add the ice. Don't add the ice before you muddle because otherwise you squish the ice and then you water it down and that's no good. 
I'm sure everyone in the club now thinks I'm a complete lush. That's a great thing to be known for. All right, so we add our ice. Then, gin. Again, free spirit. This is local, owned by a group of women. Excellent. Finally, bitters. Just a couple shakes because the end of the universe could be a bitter thing. All right, let's find the top. Hopefully this will not be the time that I shake it and it ends up all over the place. Give it a couple good shakes. All right, I'm sorry, you guys, I'm gonna have a cocktail and you're not gonna, and I feel kind of bad. There we go, my friends. The end of the universe, the end of my talk. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to drink that and also stop the recording so we can all just hang out and chat. Very nice work. <laughs>